G'day, thanks for tuning into the Noob Spiro podcast. Today I'm one of your co-hosts, Shrek, and I'll be joined later by Turbo. If you are listening to the Noob Spiro podcast, and I have no doubt that you want to get better at spearfishing, possibly hear some uh, entertaining stories along the way, you're in the right place. This is the Noob Spiro podcast where we tune out some of the some of the biggest names in spearfishing from around the world, and today is a perfect example of this. We have got Josh Humbert, and uh, Turbo and I have been fans of his for a couple of years, and and even just researching about this guy was really interesting. Um, he's he's led an, an awesome life in and around the ocean. And uh, one of his um, passion projects is Kamoka Pearls. And I would encourage you to go and check it out. Um, like if you're looking for you know a nicer type gift for one of the women in your life, this is uh, this is something I'm going to check out in the future. Um, their their story is amazing. Like um, Josh's family arrived to Tahiti in the 1970s in a homemade cement hull sailboat, and um, you know they you know fell in love with the islanders, and basically they were given a a, a, a sandy islet um, where they settled down, and um, this is where sort of Kamoka Pearl started, and they've moved it from strength to strength with um, with developing this kind of. Um, pearl fishery there and it's completely sustainable in fact they're at the, one of the front runners uh in terms of um building a sustainable um business on the ocean and i would encourage you to just check it out and read their story so it's kamokapearls.com but um yeah josh has been an underwater photographer for for a long long time and if you've seen there's a famous surf break in tahiti called called Tiapo, and it's a crazy wave like one of the most dangerous places in the world josh has taken photos all over that reef and um and uh, he tells an interesting story just as we get into this interview. But look, today's today's um, chat is great. Uh, there's a very memorable poo story at the end, which is absolutely hilarious. And uh, I really just enjoyed hearing Josh's kind of uh, mindsets around hunting and approaches. And um, and some of his stories are just excellent. It was really a real pleasure to get him on the show finally. And because, uh, like I said, it's been a long time coming. And um, today we get into another big area called, about visualization. And especially as it pertains to spearfishing, so it's a very interesting um, discussion we have, and about some of the the benefits and techniques around how you can utilise this for yourself. And uh, and it's a uh, yeah, it's a really good idea and really interesting. So before we get into that, let's get into some shout outs. And today I'm going to have a little bit of a longer intro because um, we've got a serious issue confronting spearos in Australia, particularly in New South Wales at the moment. There's a, there's a huge issue in Australia at the moment called the Marine Di- Biodiversity Project in the Hawkesbury Shelf Marine Bioregion. And basically they are locking out 25 locations so that there is absolutely no recreational fishing of any kind. They haven't come to this decision using science. Apparently there are some some political movements in the background. Um, it's a Liberal government pushing this through to get a... There's some theories about why they're doing it. But the science doesn't back up what these guys are doing. Um, Spearfishing was assessed, as was all other forms of fishing in the area, and it was assessed as a completely as a minimal risk. And so, but they've gone ahead and they're just completely locking us out. And there's a great Facebook page called Stop the Lockout. I'll link it up in today's show notes. So if you search for um, Josh Humbert Noob Spiro, that'll come up, and I'll have a link to this Facebook group in there. But that basically, um, spearfishing is, is under attack. Um, this is going to completely remove spearfishing from um, big parts of New South Wales. And you know how guys get into spearfishing is through shore diving. This is will essentially lock out a lot of those locations. And uh, there's a number of um, actions you can take. You can fill in like surveys, write letters to local members. There's there's a there's a number of actions you can take that will all make an impact. I would encourage you to make one or two. But what I'm asking you today is, um, please get get behind Spe- Spiros. Let's do something together. Go to this and join the Stop the Lockout page on Facebook, and you'll see a number of different stories and a, a number of different actions you can take to help out with fighting this because it's uh, it's it's not it's not scientifically um, backed um, this this idea, and it's not in the interests of conservation or, or or the environment. It's just it's a it's a preservationist type pact so that the ocean is locked out for you know most of us, and I, I don't think it's fair or and science doesn't back it. I, I, I I completely disagree with the ideology behind this. But anyway, I wanted to read a story out by a guy called Craig Shepard about you know what this lockout will mean to him and why it's kind of um, 
a ridiculous idea. I think it illustrates it completely. He says, hi guys, just to explain how important spearfishing is to me. He says, I grew up in a housing commission um, house in Macquarie Fields in the 1980s. We didn't have much money and my father used to take us spearfishing at Lapper House and Royal National Park. These are two of the proposed closure locations as a boy. My father would save all his money for a fortnight just for petrol to take me diving. As a family, we would fish and spearfish together, then have a, a family barbecue after a great day. We even spent the next day reliving our adventures. It was a fantastic t time to bond with the family. During these times I spent with my family, some of my mates used to go stealing cars. Who knows, if I didn't go spearfishing, maybe I might have joined them. He says, but I was fascinated with the ocean and catching fish. When I finished high school, I somehow managed to get into a science degree at UTS and moved to Cronulla, all because I love fishing. During this time, my rent was $155 a week and my Oz study allowance was $150. I also work, worked part-time delivering the local newspaper, but there wasn't much money left for anything else. Thankfully, I could spearfish and survived uni on a diet of one litre of milk a week, a few veggies, but I always had fresh fish, abalone and for half the year lobster, which I caught around Cronulla. The point for this story is basically spearfishing completely changed my life. It got me out of a wel welfare-dependent lifestyle, got me interested in science and focused me on a healthy lifestyle that I still enjoy today. He says, Now I am an environmental scientist. I, I own my own environmental consultancy company. I'm a freediving instructor and I'm excited to be teaching my 15-year-old daughter to spearfish with me as she is now catching her own amazing fish. And she wants to be an ecologist just like her father. And she sa he says, uh, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for spearfishing along Royal National Park. And, um, th you know, this is one of the closure locations. And um, I really felt Craig's story just illustrated the impact that um, this closure will have on, on regular people. And, um, you know, you know yourself that spearfishing is a selective, a highly selective and sustainable sport, especially when it's practiced um, correctly and we... And we you know, and and ninety eight percent of us do that, and um, for these people to just completely lock lock rec recreational fishing out, I think is completely unfair and unfounded. And uh, so I'd encourage you, like I said, come to today's show notes and and jump on the stop the lockout group, and check out some of the actions you can take to be part of it, because you don't want to end up like some of the countries where you know spear fishing is banned, and um, and things like this, um, and it's. You know, it's, it's completely ridiculous. So I'd encourage you to get on that today. Just quickly, there's a few shout-outs before we get into today's show. Uh, Underwater Allies, our, our buddies Crips and Tacker, have released a new video about how to cook squid and abalone. And uh, it's a great video. Uh, it's only 10, 11 minutes long, but jump on and check that out. And uh, best, best place to do that is Patreon. Type in Underwater Ally Productions Patreon. That, that'll come right up for you. Uh, Adam Price. From down there, the North Shore Underwater Club in the northern beaches of Sydney wrote me a cracker email this week, and I just a shout out to him and his club. So their club is down there, based in the northern beaches of Sydney. They've got more than 80 members, and uh, they have monthly club meetings, they have training presentations, friendly competitions. There's always plenty of newbies and plenty of experienced guys to help out. Um, the sport down there in Sydney, they've got a couple of great clubs, and uh, it's really awesome. And uh, I loved hearing a bit about their story and what they're doing, so shout out to Adam. Thanks for that email, mate. Awesome. And uh, all right, in the news... Um, I read an article in the Miami Herald this week. Uh, a bloke got arrested for eight different counts of um, breaking the some of the uh, laws up there. Um, guys, do the right thing. Learn your local rules. Uh, so one of the rules he was um, accused of breaking was shooting a fish. I believe it was 28, uh, 20, 26 inches, and the legal size for this fish was the lower limit was 28 inches and the upper limit was 32 inches. You've got a very small window to shoot that fish sounds really tough too but i mean this is something you've got to be aware of uh, local rules are very important to follow they're generally there for a reason so yeah also a near miss in the mypalmbeachpost.com uh, a bloke had a blackout um, and he was successfully uh, revived by his mate but there's a video testimony of that and he just thanks um, all of the people involved and um, making sure he was alive today. It was a really cool story and just illustrates the importance of having an awesome buddy who, who knows what to do if the worst sort of um, situation or scenario happens. So another guy shot himself in the foot. Um, it's, a, it's a good call and to make us a bit more aware about spear gun safety. I don't mean to laugh, but um, 
uh, spear guns, you know, occasionally a trigger mechanism will fail. And uh, if your spear gun's pointed, whatever it's pointed at, that shaft will go into it. So treat it like a, you know, like a loaded firearm and, um, and you can't go wrong. Just be a little bit aware, especially if you're new to the sport, um, you know, thinking about the, your spear gun and where you've got it pointed is a big thing. All right, um, Spiro Log and 99 Tips soft cover are available on Amazon.com. There's a couple of reviews I'll read out in a second. If you want to get the exclusive hardcover Spiro Log combo, um, that is still available on Indiegogo. And a number of retailers have started stocking 99 Tips to get better at spearfishing. Adreno have uh, taken on our books. Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, and now their huge new store in Perth all stocking our books. Uh, Spearfishing Superstore in Cairns have got 99 tips to get better at spearfishing and the dive shop in Port Lincoln uh, have got our 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. If you would like to see our book in your spearfishing retailer, let them know. Uh, They can contact me, Shrek at Noob Spiro, and I will be very happy to send them a box of books and get them into local retailers. That's really what we want to do. Um, So yeah, if you can help out with that, Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of quick reviews. Flatbed says 99 tips to get better at spearfishing is full of useful tips that will help everyone become better and safer. A must read for beginners and seasoned divers. Thanks for that, Flatbed. Um, just quickly, Tiffany Levesque, one of our longtime buddies from Oregon, uh, shout out to her today. She says on audible.com, because we've got an audio version of 99 tips to get better at spearfishing, she says, um, Trust me when I say that having access to these tips in audible form- format will be a time saver, dive saver, and probable life saver at some point in your freediving and spearfishing journey. So thanks for that, Tiffany. Um, if you want to get that book for free, come to today's show notes, and I will have a link in there where you can sign up for a trial on Audible, get that book for free. But look, let's get into today's interview. Longer intro today, guys. Uh, like I said, lots of important things to discuss, particularly the Stop the Lockout um, page to join on Facebook and, and fight this unfair lockout that's happening down there in New South Wales. It's attack on, on all sparrows, not just... Um, um, people in that area, I'd encourage you to get involved. Thanks for listening. Let's pump in. Let's hook into this chat with Josh Humbert. Thanks for joining us, guys. G'day, guys. If you're in need of some new equipment, maybe a new gun, some fins, or anything else you can think of, check out spearfishing.com.au. That's the online store for Adreno. They have got a huge range of gear, anything you could ever think of. And not only that, if you use the code NoobSpiro at checkout, so Go to checkout, it'll say enter a code, put in Noob Spiro, and you'll save yourself $20 on all purchases over $200. So do yourself a favor, get on to spearfishing.com.au, save yourself some money, and get some great gear. Yeah, welcome to the show, Josh. It's awesome to have you on the Noob Spiro podcast. Uh, so, and I'm happy to be back in this part of the world. I'm back in New Zealand at the moment. Turbo's in Brisbane, and I believe you're over in Portland. Mm-hmm. That's right, Portland, Oregon. And it's it's late at night there. So, thank you for joining us. Thanks to uh, to you guys. Uh, this is really, uh, you know, what, what you guys do on the Noob Spiro. It's really um, it's really valuable to me and to Spiros all over the world. You guys, uh, you guys are legends. Yeah, oh, that's, that's <laughs> not nice. What a great start. But uh, you, we've been following you for quite a while, Josh, and uh, some of your photography getting around, like you spend a lot of time in t- Tahiti and pearl diving. Your, your family's got a business over there. Really want to sort of unearth how you got started in the water because clearly you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, so um, I was basically born on a sailboat. I, I moved on to, to the, uh, the sailboat that my parents built when I was uh, about two weeks old. And we, um, we eventually sailed down to Tahiti, uh, or we were on our way to Tahiti when we stopped off on a, a little atoll called Ahe. And um, we just sort of set up camp there and uh, lived there for, for a number of years. And that, that's really where I got started, you know, in the water and in the ocean and fishing. I mean, I, I, I caught my first fish when I was two years old. And, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's something I've, I've, always, I've always been into. I didn't start spearing until I was about uh, 21 now. Okay, so you were you were, you were you were living on these islands, but you didn't get started with spearing. How come you didn't start till later on? Well, I mean, I, I, I started, you know, like, like poking around just like like kids do, but um, I didn't get started uh, like spearfishing heavily um, until I, I was actually in, in the middle of college, and uh, I, I went down to, to help my dad on the the pearl farm that he was just starting, and uh, yeah, I just I ended up never going back to school, and uh, 
and uh, that, that's when I got I got really really heavy into into spearing at that time. Yeah, nice. You're also into surfing, um, and especially surf photography. Like, I think I think um, you've you've spent a fair bit of time on the the Tiapo reef over there, and uh, I, th- I saw one of your shots the other day. It was cool. Did you did you get sucked over the falls in that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I, I started um, uh, shooting surfing in, in Chopo in, in 2008. Uh, we, we we have a house there uh, that we built in um, in 2003. So we, we basically we, we lived on the pro farm from '92 to about '99, and then '99 um, on in uh, in Chopo, Tahiti. And so yeah, so yeah, I, I did get sucked over the falls. Uh, that was pretty exciting. I was actually uh, <laughs> I was shooting uh, Kieran Perot for for you surfers out there. You probably know who that is. And uh, I just had a little bit too much momentum, and I got I got sucked over the falls and ended up landing on my feet. And um, oh. I, I I snapped one of my fins in half, but uh, I was really lucky. I you know I, I didn't hurt myself, but if I landed head first, I would have just uh, yeah that would have been the that would have been the end of me for sure. <laughs> wow, it looks it looks deadly that thing. I mean, <clears throat> Turbo's a, a gnarly surfer too, so he might have to come over. When, when you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the chest on me? I'm not paddling into anything. Yeah, not, not with those huge lats you've got these days. Um, he, he, was, he was telling me the other day, Josh. That was a private conversation. <laughs> he was telling me the other day, Josh, that he was outside and the wind was blowing so hard. <laughs> It just picked him up and carried him because his lats, he's like a sugar glider now, he said. He just picked him up and carried him. So, yeah, look, you're in. You're, you're def- that's, a, that's a true story. You're definitely in. <laughs> you're definitely in elite company today. So, um, like, so you've been pearl. What age did you start pearl diving as well? Uh, so, so when, when I moved out to, uh, to the farm, you know, when, when my, my dad started the farm, um, that was um, around 92 is when, when I got there. You know, started diving uh, right away. It's, so basically, the the free diving that that, that was how we did um, most of the work. We we had tanks, but it it, it turns out that that uh, lots of the work is actually faster to do free diving than than with uh, than with air. Um, okay. Like diving the, the uh, buoys down down to the lines. I guess you, I guess you call them uh, boys over there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but we can understand American. It's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually that check that you that you do this whole interview with your uh, uh, accent, your American accent. It's uh, <laughs> second to none. <laughs> oh, uh, we get. He's very talented. We get, we, he, you've got to hear his Scottish accent. It is the best. Oh, no, no. Let's let's. My Chinese is better. No, oh, yeah, I've heard your Chinese. It's been a whole year there. It's rubbish. I prefer I prefer your Scottish. Josh, the um. The when you when you're diving for these pearls, mate, what sort of like depth and how many dives in a day would you be putting in if you're like on an average day at work? Right. So it, it depends what what work we're doing. If we're um, if we're just like taking oysters out and picking them up, you know, we'll, we'll you know we'll do maybe I don't know twenty thirty dives, something like that. They're they're, they're pretty short though, you know, down down to down to uh, twenty five thirty maybe forty feet. Um, what really stretches you is um, uh, diving buoys so we'll, we'll we'll go out on the lines and we'll, we'll we'll dive buoys for you know all morning and and you might like one person might dive uh 60 buoys for example um oh, wow and, and each buoy you're you're taking down to um as deep as 40 feet and you're to get it down you, you have to kick as, as hard as you humanly can to, just to get it down there and uh We'd have lunch sometimes, and we we basically be, be falling asleep in our in our food because we're so totally and completely exhausted from the uh, morning of diving. But what what was neat about it was that um we'd go spearfishing on on those days, and we'd be really tired, but um we'd feel like we had just like endless air. Like it was it was really interesting how um how that really intense uh, diving it, it really really stretched our our lungs. Wow. So that, that was something that I've sort of uh, carried with me ever since. Like, like now, like if I'm, if I dive for, you know, three, four, five hours, whatever, like I, I, I really st- just sort of like settle into it and, and know that, that the longer I dive, like I may be getting more tired, but you, you're also doing better, better breath holds. That's, that's my feeling anyway. A lot, a lot of these guys that, wow. that do the commercial diving too, like yourself, they've got phenomenal um, breath holds and technique. Um, like I dived with Pat Swanson um, last year in March, and he's an ex-commercial diver. He's like in his uh, mid-50s now, and he he was just smashing me. Like all day he was just like 
less bot less um, surface interval, more time on the bottom, and he was just doing it consistently. He's just a workhorse, and like half of the guys you you know like Dwayne Herbert uh, over in New Zealand and around New Zealand, uh, so around Australia, a lot of the champion divers are all like ex ex commercial divers or one form of another. It just seems to give you these long lasting benefits, as, and it sounds like that's something you've found as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I actually met Pat in in Tahiti a, a bunch of years ago. He he came to um to Tahiti for the the uh, the World Championships, and I, I was fortunate to, to to house him and and and, and the whole crew he, he was with. Uh, it was really cool diving with those guys. I definitely learned a lot, and um and yeah, it's, it, it was really a really unique experience. He he actually recommended we get you on as well. He was one of a host of people that recommended we chat with you. Another guy was um, Duncan Henderson. He 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 went and dived with you for a while, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duncan uh, came out to the farm uh, last year for for a couple months. That, that was great having him there. He's a yeah. uh, a, a gun builder and uh, yeah, great great diver, very strong in the water and. I think he enjoyed his time there. Uh, yeah, he makes the widow maker stuff, and we're going to see a bit more of that in the future. But uh, you know, that's cool, man. All right. Um, if if guys want to have a go at like pearl diving or commercial diving or one form or another, do you have any advice to help them get into it? it it's pretty tough to um, to break into the whole Tahitian scene, um, just because you you need to be a, a resident to do that. But pretty much anyone can go there just on vacation. I mean, we we actually take um, take take people uh, year round that just come and come and help out and, um, you know, in exchange for, for room and board, you know, just a, a very casual, friendly kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, if, you know, if people are interested in that, they can just, you know, get, get in touch with me via Instagram or, or whatever. All right, cool, cool. Oh, awesome. All right. Okay, so you got started when you were 21. Let's go there. What, what did you, what, what were some of the things you really struggled with? I guess just a total lack of, um, of information. You know, this is uh, 90, whatever, 95, I guess. And, uh, you know, podcasts weren't a thing. Uh, the internet wasn't a thing. Um, even just like books were, were kind of, kind of hard to come by. I mean, there were some, um, obviously, um, yeah, yeah just, I, I think I just have to say struggling with, with having good information. I mean, I, I did plenty of really stupid things. I, I'm, I'm very lucky to still be here today, basically. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, tell us one of those lessons you learned. Well, I learned that hyperventilating is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. What is a, what is hyperventilation? Well, what what were you doing? What were you doing? That's probably even a better definition. All right. So I, I was doing the the stupidest thing I could possibly be doing. Um, you probably guessed that it's uh, static breath holds by myself in the ocean. Oh wow. And I, I was uh, I was doing breath holds on the uh, the, the oyster platform. And, you know, I, I figured I, I was going to just really go for it and, and do a really good time. And uh, so, you know, I, I breathed up a, a bunch of times really fast in and out, you know, just just like like like, like I, I, I figured I probably should, because it seemed like when, when I did that, I, I, I felt like I, I had more air, which, you know, yeah. you know, as we know now is not actually true. But yeah, <laughs> but uh, so, so basically, I, you know, I, I took my, my last breath and I went down and I, I was holding on and holding on, and holding on. And, and um the last time I looked at my watch, it was uh, 3:35, and then oh. I, I started. To, oh. I started to come up r- real slowly um, on the the uh, the, the galvanized uh, tube that I was holding on to. I blacked out. I blacked out, and um, and just as I blacked out, my, my my head came came just above water, and and okay. the, the, the the coolness of the air kind of kind of woke me up, and and I I, I came back too, um, and, oh, uh, and wow. then right at that, that very moment, the the uh, boat pulled up and. My wife was there, and and she she looked down at me, and uh, and I, I I held up uh, you know the, the OK sign, and then like a thumbs up, and then like an <laughs> and I I mumbled something about like I'm okay, it's all good, I'm fine, I'm fine, and and she just kind of like like you know like shot laser beams through me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. She was not not impressed, you know. She was pregnant with our daughter at the time, and uh, oh. yeah, she wasn't impressed with my my tomfoolery. I was gonna say, Josh. So, like, a lot of guys like heard would have heard that story, but they'd probably like to know exactly what it is you're doing wrong. So, like hyperventilation, some people call it over breathing. What what exactly were you doing? Like, can you describe your breathing? Yeah. So I was just. Um, I was taking deep breaths and then exhaling fairly quickly and then deep breath, exhaling, deep breath, exhaling. And okay. I mean, that's it basically. And, and, and why, why don't we want to do that? Like as spear fishermen, C- can you explain the mechanism a little bit more? 
Uh, well, it, it suppresses your, your urge to breathe. It, you know, it, it tricks you into thinking that you have more air than, than you have. Yeah, I, I uh, try to take a, a free dive course every every five or six years or so, and um, I'm definitely due for uh, for a little yeah. brush up. <laughs> nah, nah, like your explanation's good. Like on, honestly, like yeah, that is what it does. It, it it hides our urge to breathe, and so we push it a little bit further than we should, and that's basically you know why we shouldn't do it. That's perfect, man. Um, okay, so you, you blame like a lack of information partly for you know making some of these early early um, mistakes. I mean, what what information has been helpful for you? Um, you know, in your continual learning journey, have you found any good books or reference material to help you? <laughs> I feel like this is a heavily loaded question. <laughs> 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 yeah, Josh, have you found any books, perhaps nah, podcasts nah, nah, that have look, been particularly look, helpful? Look, there's, there's plenty of good books out there. We know that. We know which one's the best, but there's plenty of good ones. There's other ones as well. Um, other than 99 Tips to Get Better at Everything. <laughs> really? That's available on Indiegogo, by the way. <laughs> pretty sure that there's no other books on, on uh, spearfishing and diving on the market. I, I think that's the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was good enough for me. I was asking like a, a, a semi like no, I was asking a serious question because a lot of people like like Andre Andre Pelizari's book or um, Terry Masters books. Did, did... <laughs> hang on, hang on. I've just got to open up another floor here. <laughs> Andre Pelizari. Oh, what's his name? Are you, are you talking about Umberto oh, Pelizari? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm right up. Like 99 Tips is the only book on the market. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, okay. So I, I did. I, I did read um, Terry Moss's book and um, I think I think I read Pelzari's Pal- book. So, yeah, I, I read I read the classics, but um, but that, that was probably uh, after after already being into it for, for a few years. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. That uh, Umberto's book and uh, Pippin's book, they, they are awesome. I, I loved that uh, Umberto Pelizzari's book. I thought, uh, sorry, the Pippin Ferrer's book. But it was really, it was quite scary stuff and uh, sort of opened my eyes up a bit. Um, I think, I reckon probably before 99 Tips, everybody read um, Umberto Pelizzari's book. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone's read it. It's a great book. Yeah. Um... Okay, so like you, you you you've cited this lack of information, and and maybe you read a couple of books later on. How did you kind of get past it? Did you just was it just fully trial and error? Yeah, I mean it's just diving a lot, just you know like uh, diving for work, so diving every day. I and mean, this is when when I was living out of the pro farm and um, and uh, just being in the water every single day, basically. Yeah, you know we, we weren't like we weren't competition diving. We were just we were just diving a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I mean I never felt like there's any particular like hurdle that I had to clear or anything. It was just kind of, it was just kind of what, what we did. And it was, yeah. you know, as far as the, the spearing, it was, it was always just for food. Like we never had any notion of, uh, you know, records or, you know, shooting whatever the craziest dish we could. It was just about bringing, bringing food home. So, so we could eat. Yeah. Cool. Trek, we got a, a deal for the listeners from Spearing Magazine, mate. What's Spearing Magazine like? Oh, it's up in lights. It's amazing. It's Katy Perry on a swing. It's it's hot dogs. It's it's the Red Sox in May. It's you know, it's everything America. Wow, that's it's not everything America though, is it? Because the latest epi- the latest edition's got uh, Australian Spiro Daniel Mann in it. Is that right? Yes, we get the best stories from around the world as well. But it's spearfishing, waterman. Okay, cool. Phenomenal. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Okay, Talented okay, cool, people. Man. Pictures. My God. Yeah, I get it. It's big. It's great. It looks good. It's it's well written. Spearymagazine.com. Um, hoorah. Yeah, okay. So what's the deal? What's the deal you have for listeners? It's, it's, it's not just any deal, Turbo. It is Spearymagazine.com. Eight <laughs> issues. Eight issues is phenomenal. Amazing. Yeah, eight issues for how much? $30 US plus shipping. Oh, that's actually really good. That, that is phenomenal. You were, you were dead right. Turbo, um, it's so cheap. cheap. I can't even do the math on this. It's just amazing. Well, it's actually it's three three dollars seventy five an issue plus shipping. But it's uh, thirty dollars so, US for eight issues. Turbo, that's all anyone needs to know. Just email yeah. Jeremy at SpearingMagazine dot com. How do you spell that? Jeremy J E R O M Y at SpearingMagazine dot com.
I think we might move on to memorable fish because I wanted to ask you now. You've shot a, is a world record ling cod. Is that right? No, uh, world record cabinet. <laughs> Good research, Turbo. It was so close. It was terrible. That was terrible. <laughs> was that? that was... What an awful co-host. Anyway, Josh, hang on, hang on. talk about your cameras on, mate. Was that one of the special fish for you? Well, hold on. I, I would have shot the, the the world record ling cod if if uh, if I if I had had a uh, just a, a better pull spear. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, so this is uh, it was last summer. It was actually almost exactly a year ago. I I'd been invited um, w- with some friends to go out on a Saturday, and then at the last minute, uh, uh, another friend had invited me to go out on the Friday, and so I, I went out on on the Friday and went, went to this spot um, that's, that's pretty pretty far offshore. Okay. And uh, and on my I think it was my second dive I went down and I, and I shot this this beautiful cabazon that that ended up being a being a, a world record. Oh wow! Um, and then uh, and then and then just just after that just after shooting that fish I I uh, I went down and I I um, sort of sort of crept o- over this ledge at about forty feet and and uh, I looked down and there was laying out there was just the, the absolutely the the biggest lingcod I'd, I'd ever seen by by a long shot. I mean it was. Mm-hmm. It was big enough to to swallow the the uh, thirty inches that we usually shoot, um, you know, pretty pretty easily. And so I, I just sort of sighted up on it with my my little cheap yellow bull spear, little uh, fiberglass bull spear, uh, with, with a little yeah. tiny flopper, a little like one inch flopper, just like. And the flopper is only one inch from the tip, so that's yeah. So anyway, so I, I sighted up on it and I hit it. I hit it right in the head, right wow. in the cheek, and um, it was a, it was a good shot, or I thought it was anyway. And and it sort of pulled me into the the uh, cave that, that was right there and you know i'm struggling with it and and i'm but i'm you know pretty sure that, that it's mine and then and then it somehow just comes off and so i you know i swim up oh. super super frustrated and uh and then whatever we, you know we we, we finished finished the dive finished our day we you know we, we get other fish too and, um mm-hmm. and i go back the, the next day the, the saturday with with uh my uh three other friends and um you know, it, it's this pinnacle that that's offshore, so it's really hard to you know, to have any any bearings for. We, we finally found it, and and then once we found it, uh, it took me about about forty minutes to find the uh, the cave again. And I was just kind of um, satiated from from having shot the uh, the cabazon. I just I didn't have the uh, bloodlust that that I I probably needed. You know, so I I I, I finally found the the cave, and I I put my my buddy Brian on it, and. Um, on his first dive, he went down and and uh, and he, he shot this this fish. And then w- once once we we put it in, in the boat, we, we looked at it and, and we we could tell it was the same fish because uh, we we could see the the spot where where I had shot it the, the previous day, and it was it was already almost healed up. It was pretty amazing. So yeah, it was kind of interesting to see how how fast fish can actually recover from a uh, from injury. But uh, yeah, so that uh, that was the story of the, the giant linka. That, that was that was my. <laughs> My fish that got away story, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, was that off your local waters there, off like off the northern west, northern uh, yeah, west coast? Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, so where are your local spots there? Like, just walk us through like Portland spearfishing because you guys got pretty good scene there. Like, uh, where, where are you guys kind of spearing? So, where, where we are in Portland, we're about uh, about an hour and a half, two hours from from the coast. So here we have the uh, Columbia River and the the uh, Willamette River, and it's possible to to spear some fish in those rivers. Um, I think mostly carp. Carp's about the only thing that we're legally allowed to, to take. Okay. Uh, but on the on the ocean, there's um, there's you know it's it's kind of tough here in, in uh, central and northern Oregon just because there, there's not a whole lot of structure. Like there's okay. there's big expanses of of uh, sandy beach, so yep. you have uh, to find where they're they're broken up by by jetties or or where, where you can find. Uh, you know, pinnacles or, you know, any kind of rocky structure offshore. Yeah. Do you have artificial reefs and stuff or is it, was there headlands and like these sorts of spots? Yeah, there, there's no artificial reefs. Um, basically the, the ocean here, it, it's, it's pretty nasty um, uh, most of the year. So there's, you know, there, there aren't many people that, that get out there in boats and um, it's pretty wild uh, a lot. So it's a really good thing because it, it keeps the, uh, you know, the, the pressure off and, um, and when you can get out, you know, when it does clear up, then the, the the fishing is actually it's really good. It's it's well it's well uh, looked after too. The um, ODFW um, they uh, 
do a do, do a good job, um, you know, making sure that we don't wipe it out, basically. Yeah, right. All right. So for for someone new in Oregon, uh, what's the best time of year to start out spearfishing? Um, I'd say probably the spring. Right. Yeah, summer's tough because the the water can get really cold. Mm-hmm. It'll get down to uh, you know the, the whatever forty four degrees. I guess that's like six six degrees. I think Celsius. But yeah, and, and also the the uh, visibility get, gets um, it goes from uh, from bad to, to worse in the in the summer. And it's it's always pretty lousy here. Basically, if we have six feet of biz, we're we're, we're pretty happy. <laughs> okay, That's is, is that um, is that due to the runoff from those big rivers? No, it's just. Um, it's just, uh, it's just, it's just really fertile. You know, there, there's lots of upwelling, and and the the water is really rich, and it, it's full of, uh, it's full of life. You know, it's full of um, jellyfish and and zooplankton and phytoplankton and and everything is just kind of um, alive out there. Yeah, right. Okay, and um, so uh, we're going spearfishing in spring if we can. We're going to expect uh, six foot of viz at best. What uh, I'm guessing you guys mainly short of then if the weather's so bad offshore. What uh, what sort of depth are we looking at for productive ground for um, your fish species? Um, so it, it, it all happens in the first, uh, geez, the first 40 feet, really. I mean, it, there's really very little need to go, go deeper than that. You know, um, here it's typically, um, it's easy diving. It's easy diving and, and it's typically easy hunting. You know, we, we, we joke about it being a, a, a golden age and, you know, I'm, I'm almost kind of hesitant to, to say that on a on, on a podcast, but um, but the uh, truth of it is that is that the ocean really kind of um, it it protects itself here. You know, it's not there aren't really that many opportunities to to get out there. So um, you know, when when you do the fishing is actually it's actually really good. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, right. Okay, so we're talking um, <clears throat> we're talking bad viz, we're talking cold water. So. Uh, what are you talking? Seventy centimeter guns, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, 60, 60 centimeters, seventy centimeters, whatever, seventy-five, probably max. I mean, you know, it it will open up to twenty feet sometimes, uh, a, a couple days a year, basically. But uh, but yeah, it, it's pretty rare. The, the you know the, the typical typical viz is um you know is, is about six foot, maybe eight foot, maybe on a on a good eight ten foot, maybe. Yeah, right, and. Um, I guess new guys, I mean, you know, in a lot of parts of the world, uh, entry and exit points for shore diving and current um, is, is a real problem uh, when you're starting out, rip, rip tides and that kind of thing. Uh, any advice for the, the Portland area or the Oregon, for Oregon? Is it a, a tides and current sort of a danger for you guys? Yeah, definitely. They're, they're definitely, a, definitely a danger. I, I would say for, for, um, for people starting out, um, your best bet would be to dive the uh, jetties, and um, you know, as I'm sure it's the same everywhere. But you typically want want to dive at, at high slack. Um, yep. It's when the, the you know the, the the cleaner ocean water comes in. But uh, yeah, I really kind of feel that, that that everyone should just should should get out there. You know, I, um, it's uh, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, I guess <laughs> <laughs> I guess you can edit this part out, right? <laughs> no editing for you, Josh. Hey, um, I was I was gonna say I was gonna say like you know you're going from Tahiti, which is like crystal clear water. You've got big pelagic fish, exciting visibility, warm water, and then you're coming back and you're jumping in Portland, Oregon, six foot um, visibility. Um, there are some great eating species and stuff like that there. And like you say, when the conditions allow you to, it's great. But like, seriously, I was going to ask you like, where does your motivation come from? And because a, a lot of the people that do it in those parts of the world are the most motivated Spiros that, that you know, like we talk with guys in Scotland and that they're super motivated and, and that they're great to talk to because they're super passionate. Where does your motivation come from for it all? I just love to dive. I love to dive. I love to be in the ocean. Um, I don't eat. Um, meat, so I, I I depend on fish to feed myself and, and feed my family. I just love to dive. I don't care if it's if it's murky or clear or whatever. I'm I'm just I'm, I'm happy in the water, and um, it's always worth it to to go diving. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Awesome, cool. All right. Um, but yeah. Okay, can Turbo. I, can I can I fire a few more uh, Oregon questions? Sure, off sure, sure. So uh, I wanted to uh, ask you about. Water temps. How how cold are we? Sort of. What's the variation there? So the so the variation um, 
basically here uh, we, it varies between about 44 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about um, 6 to 15 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's terrible. So, <laughs> so what are we looking at, 5 to 7 mil wetsuits? Uh, some guys wear 5 mil, but uh, 7, 7 mil is the, the uh, typical guy. I, I, I have a, a brand new uh, 7 mil pathos that, that I really like. I've been diving in the same suit for almost eight years, and uh, I just got a, a new pathos for a, a trip up to up to Alaska that I took uh, a month or two ago. Oh wow! Mm. All right. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask, I want to talk talk about species. So we mentioned um, lingcod, we mentioned cabazon. Uh, what other fish species do you target um, in Oregon? The monkey face prickle back up there. You know, it, it, it's funny because um, uh, I uh, heard that that uh, that podcast that you did with, with Jim Russell, which was really yeah. really good. And I'd never heard of that eel. And then I was um, I was at one of our jetties, and um, this fisherman pulled up this uh, this wriggling uh, like ten inch long thing on his line, and uh, <laughs> and he couldn't get it off. And so I, I went over to help him, and, and it was it was a, a trickle faced monkey backer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we were saying too. We really battled with the name, but um, did did he did he take that home or did he chuck it back? It, it was tiny. It was just a it was just oh, a, yeah. a really small eel that oh. had somehow um, uh, attacked his lure, which um, seems unlikely. But um, but yeah, and and uh, we did, I helped him unhook it and we we, we released it. But it, it had a really beautiful uh, red fringe on it. Um, it was a real real neat looking little little fish. So you, yeah, cool. so you're getting all the same species as um, as Matt Madison and 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 maybe Jim, or, or is it or is it starting to change more significantly up there? Jim is spoiled because he's down in uh, in Monterey. Um, yeah, yeah. He even has the occasional white sea bass and and sheep's head and real exotic fish like like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Here, we don't we don't have anything like that. We're we're too far north for abalone even. Oh wow! All oh, right. Yeah, to get abalone. What about- we have to go to the very, very southern part of the state, and and, and uh, as you guys probably know, it's closed everywhere. It's closed in Oregon, closed yeah. in California. So yeah, what about um, crayfish? Do you get any sort of lobster or crayfish, anything like that? You no, know, we we don't, um, which is terrible. But we, we do have okay. um, crabs, uh, Dungeness crabs, which, which are which are really tasty. Um, they're definitely some of the, the better eating crabs I've had in, anywhere in the world. Um, and they're real, uh, they're real abundant. It's real, real easy to, to find them. And you just dive down and, and pick them up from the hind legs. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're kind of, they're, it's funny. They're, they're just the perfect, the, the perfect crab because they're, they're slow. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're getting pinched by them, you, you probably deserve it. And, uh, <laughs> they're, they're just like, they're, they're full of meat and, um, and they're just, uh, they're, they're just really, really tasty. We, we usually get them as we, we go to the, uh, to the, uh, the the estuaries and um, we'll do uh, drift dives where um, uh, you usually use like a boat or a kayak or something and jump in the water uh, upstream and, and drift drift downstream t- towards the ocean and then uh, and then just just like, like do it again uh, over and over and then you, you'll just kind of be flying over the, these shallows and uh, you you just see the crab and you just dive down and grab it in like sometimes it, it can be in like six feet of water so it can be really shallow sometimes. Okay. Well, that actually sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a blast. Good. Okay, next part of the show is um, hunting technique. I wanted to ask you before that though, what's your favorite species to hunt and why? I feel like I'm kind of I'm kind of a schizophrenic on this because my the hunting that I've done the most of in my life is is in tropical waters and um, but uh, to bring value to to the listeners around here, I, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I should talk about uh, about cold water stuff, but. Um, but yeah, my, my I guess my, my favorite species is um, in the warm water, and it would be it would be jacks of different kinds, um, like the the uh, 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 I think it's called the blue bluefin trevally. And uh, the way we, we hunt them is, is um, just just you, you get up real early in the morning, and and you, you go and you, you find a place where, where you think that they're going to swim by, and you you lay down and try and camouflage yourself in the in the coral as much as possible, and uh, and just wait, you know, like some, some people think it's really boring and, and I understand that, but I just, I like it. It's uh it's fun and it's really satisfying when the, when the fish comes by and, and you get them. Are they, are they, uh, do you think they're by far the best eating Jack? Um, so in Tahiti, we, we have, um, we have, a, you know, a bunch of different species. Um, and among the species, there's different, different grades, but I'd say they're all really good. I mean, I, 
probably the one that's that's the least good is the the really big one, the, the giant Tarali. But even that, you know, you do uh, sashimi with it or whatever, and it's it's amazing too. So, yeah, like like I always say, there's there's no there's no bad fish. There's only bad cooks. <laughs> yep, good call. Cool. Because they've got a bit of a um, oh, not a stigma, but they're not highly prized here in Australia. I wouldn't say jacks. Yeah, which is really funny because. Um, in a lot of the Pacific Islands, you go and they absolutely love them. They prefer them over a lot of other fish. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really interesting the the uh, social stigma that that there is around around eating fish of, of different different kinds. Like, like like here, you know, no one would would ever eat a carp, but you know, you go to Asia and and it's a delicacy, and you know, I don't know, and that's that that's true for for lots of different species. And um, I've taken like fairly rubbish fish to some of my. Um, friends that own Asian restaurants in Brisbane there and the things they can do with just about any fish is phenomenal and uh, so you're right you're right there's terrible cooks and unfortunately a lot of us just all, all we know how to do is fillet it and throw it in a pan and um, there's a lot of different there's a lot of different ways to cook you're getting into my area of passion here Josh um, look <laughs> so like with guys that want to want to hunt these bluefin trevally or what do you what's what's type of jack is that uh, fish Eddie is what we call them in, in Tahiti. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think in Hawaii they call them omilu. Okay. So you, you get down there in the right terrain. Obviously, you're expecting the fish to come by. You get. You said you get on the bottom, hide in some 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 coral or something. Um, what are some common mistakes uh, people make when they try and hunt them? Um, just just um, exposing too much of, of your body, like not not being hidden enough, and then and then also. Um, not sighting down your, your your gun, you know, um, like just kind of waiting randomly, and then and then the the fish shows up and it's it's at close proximity, and and if you had been uh, looking down your gun, you, you know, you could get the shot off, but in the time that it takes you to to uh, to sight it up, then the the fish is gone. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, Riley Logan, um, one of our listeners, he uh, wants us to ask more about Shrek's passion of eating. And um, he wanted he wanted me to ask you uh, what is your favourite way to like cook and pro- or process and cook a fish or of any type. So let's maybe stick with Jack. Okay, so um, I would do it um, a la chinoise, um, basically Chinese style. I would uh, gut it and then chunk it and then put it in a pan to to steam. Um, but before before I start steaming it, I'd, I'd make a paste with uh, with preserved lemon. Wow. Ginger, garlic, and uh, and some uh, brown sugar, and then uh, you basically just just mix up this paste and then spread it on the fish, and then uh, and then steam it, and then all of the the flavor of the of the paste sort of seeps down in, into the fish, and and then when you take it out, uh, put some green chives on it, and um, you've got a really amazing meal. Fellas, I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to carry on the interview. Um, just <laughs> shooting to the kitchen. All right. <laughs> oh mate, it's. It's 4.52 in the afternoon here, and you started saying all that stuff, and I sort of went off in a little trance. Like, oh, he was. <laughs> and, um, and, and pescatarians are, in my experience, very good cooks because they really appreciate what they do with the fish. Um, so, no, that, that is a very good method. I would like to try that myself. It was 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. It's all about free diving, hunting techniques, Boat diving, shore diving, everything spearfishing is in there. And and guess what? As an audio book, it is free. It's free on Audible for our listeners. Shrek, how do they get themselves a copy of the free 99 Tips audio book? There's two ways. Come to today's show notes page and click on the Audible trial link and it'll take you through where you can get a free book of your choice and a 30-day membership for nothing. Or you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash noob spiro n-o-o-b-s-p-e-a-r-o and get your hands on a free book of your choice you don't even have to get 99 tips to get better at spearfishing yeah but that'd be the best thing wouldn't it well it's the best book on there but you know like i didn't i didn't want to be too self-promoting yeah well i i to be honest with you i got on there i was going to get the book but i instead i got jamie oliver um cook that was pretty good Let's be honest, you you didn't get that. You you got a romance, a paranormal romance book. <laughs> <laughs> Head over to audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. All right, next part of the show is toughest situation. But what's the toughest situation you've been in in the ocean? What was 
what was the scenario? What's what 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 kind of happened? What led up to it, and, and what actions did you take? Okay, so um, uh, it was in in my early early years of spearfishing when I um, didn't have uh, a clue really. I, I I had gone out at lunchtime to get um, or j- just before lunch to get to get four fish. That that was my my uh, my mission was to get four fish because there was four of us back at the farm and all I needed was four fish and. So I was um, I was shooting this one particular kind of a fish. It's uh, I was just reading it's it's a kind of a job fish, but it's not the green job fish, the big one. It's a it's a smaller one. Rosy, rosy job fish. Yeah, it's sort of maroon colored. That's it. Uh, paru is what we call it in Tahiti. And I I shot three of them, and then uh, and and then two two grays uh, came around gray, gray reefs. And uh, oh, and and uh, I was I was with a a buddy um, from. Uh, from Kansas, from from America, you know, the very very center of of, of the country. Uh, he'd never yeah. been in the ocean before, and, uh, and we were on the on the outside, so like on the the, the outside of the reef. Okay. At, at the time, I'd I'd been fishing inside a lot, and uh, uh, when, when you fish inside, all, all you see are are, uh, are black tips, and uh, and so with, with with black tips, when they come around, you can just sort of like slap the water, and then the you know the the sound will scare them off, and and then. Uh, and that's it. You're kind of done with them. But you know, the the gray is not that that you find outside are are you know a very very different animal. And so so basically, uh, I, I shot these three fish, and I just needed I needed one more. And the, you know, these two sharks came around. And I thought, okay, I should stop fishing here. This you know this is a bad idea. So you know, I thought I'd swim maybe a hundred yards or so away and to a different zone and and, um, and fish there. And so we started swimming away, and then I saw I saw the you know I saw the the uh, fish that I needed. And so I just kind of got greedy and sort of sort of broke my own rule <laughs> and went down and and uh, and I, I shot it and I and as soon as I shot it the the uh, two sharks that that I that I had lost track of um, were, were right on the fish um, and I I found out later from my friend that I didn't see them because they're they were directly behind me when when I shot the fish and so I, I'm coming up from the dive pulling the fish um, towards me and and. Um, and they, they both came up and one of them grabbed the fish and it, it snapped the uh, the uh, shooting line. And then the uh, second shark came up, came up really fast. And and uh, I got to the surface and, and I, I had just the, the really bad reflex of, of, uh, of slapping the, the water. Uh. So wh- what that does for the grays is it just kind of it makes them go crazy. You know, so here, here they, they, they tasted blood. And then now there's this there's this wounded thing on the surface like. <laughs> oh, man. and uh and so this um so so and the the uh, second problem with that was that i i made basically like a fog of little tiny bubbles so all of a sudden like i you know i, I have these two super super aggressive sharks and and i can't i can't see them because i've i've you know i've surrounded myself by just this this haze of of little bubbles and so, so out of this haze comes comes one of the sharks, and it's coming right right from my shoulder, like absolutely intent on on uh, on taking a bite. And um, I I had just just enough time to sort of move move my shoulder to the side and, and hit him in the side of the head with the the uh, butt of the gun. And then at virtually the, the same moment, the the second shark came between my head and and, and my friend's head, uh, just like you know inches from from our ears. At like you know at what seemed like sixty miles an hour, just just going so fast, oh, and wow. uh, it was just a it was a real like white knuckle moment. And um, yeah, it, it was interesting though because my you know in school you you, you learn about um, you, you learn about fight or flight. You know, like you either you either you either run like hell or you you, you know you, you put them up. And um, and uh, I was really surprised to find that that as soon as um, the situation got critical like that, my my impulse was to was to want to fight. Like I, I kept hoping that, that they would come closer so that I could, I could, you know, I could hit them harder. Like <laughs> it's, it's kind of, kind of, kind of ridiculous in, in retrospect, but uh, it was just interesting to, um, to, to live through that, uh, you know, that, that whole flight or flight or fight thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit of self-discovery. I think honestly, like maybe in that position, you're better off with the fight reaction because like, um, if you can give them some sort of vibe that you're not like this, a defenseless, 
basically a human uh, because we are really defenseless in the water against them. Like all we've got is a, maybe the spear gun in between us to just give them a poke and warn them off. But really like you just want to establish that you're not completely defenseless with them. And so if you start swimming away and panicking, like in that situation when you've got fish on you, maybe that would be even worse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I, I, I was kind of hesitant to, to, to even tell the, the story. I, I've heard your, your other podcast guests uh, talk about, you know, you know, being bitten by bull sharks and clutching at, at the bones of their, their wrist and, and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is nah, that. I, I think, I think like the near misses teach us a lot, just as much as the accidents do. Like, as long as you can see some like clear takeaways from like, okay, this is what I'm going to do differently um, next time. So, what, 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 what have you changed in your diving practices since you had that experience? Well, I mean, I mean, I, I changed it instantly. I mean, like I said, that this was many, many, many years ago, and I just, um, I just kind of, I, I just sort of lost my my cool in the moment. You know, I, I, I reacted in, in a in a way that that wasn't consistent with, with what I know about sharks and what I, you know, what I know about how to act in the, in the ocean. So it's just about, um, about keeping a, keeping a cool head and not, not being stupid. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. No, no, good, good cool. story, man. All right. Next part of the show is a veteran's fault. And, uh, unfortunately pirate P got the sack. So I have to do the intro for the segment now. But basically, this is the part of the show where we go deep into an area of our um, of our guest expertise. And today, we wanted to get into chatting with um, visualization, um, you know, as it relates to spearfishing. So, wanted to get kind of just a general overview on what visualization actually is. Mm. Okay, so um, it's something that you do before you go you go fishing. It's something that you can do when, when you're you're lying in your bed. It's just a way to sort of pre-program your your head before you're 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 actually in, in the water. So you might like picture yourself, you know, out out on the water, breathing up slowly, and and just sort of like bring into the experience as much of the sensory detail as as possible. Um, you know, the the uh, taste of the salt in your mouth and how it feels to to just to just be there, and then and. Uh, and and so 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 basically, what what you're trying to do is you're you're trying to just put yourself in the in the ocean and and in the uh, diving experience in in as much detail as possible, so that when you actually go to dive, everything just sort of will, will just sort of happen uh, automatically. Yeah. Okay. So it's like um, you're activating kind of your neural pathways to prime you for something. It's kind of like you're 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 warming up the engine of your mind so that you're kind of ready to do something is that kind of am i, am I on the right track exactly exactly oh, yeah, that's, okay. that's, that's that's exactly it and then what, right, what cool. you'll find is that after you've done it when you actually go go diving you'll find that that you'll be doing things kind of uh automatically without even thinking about them you know like it, it can just really help with with accuracy and with um with being relaxed and a uh, solid diver of of I've actually heard a little bit about this process. Um, I listened to a podcast called the Ben Greenfield um, podcast. Turbo actually put me onto it, and um, at first I didn't like it. But anyway, um, some of the high performance athletes they they do this in all different parts of sport, and um, so it's interesting that you draw it. Uh, you know, into you've drawn it into spearfishing. What does kind of like your process look like? So let's just say you're going diving tomorrow um, off Tahiti. Um, what does your visualization process look like? So, so basically, yeah, I mean, I'm just um, imagine myself in, in the water. I like, like, like I was saying, I, I sort of taste the uh, salt in my mouth. I, I feel how the surface is just kind of um, moving me gently, and I do my breathe ups, um, uh, long, long, slow breaths, and and uh, I just sort of like I, I seek out any any areas in my body that are that are maybe tense or that, that need to be relaxed, and and then I just I imagine myself taking my last breath, uh, doing doing a good duck dive, just just like I learned in my in my uh, my free dive course, and um, bending at the waist and yeah. going um, going down nice and smooth with you know with 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 minimal effort and holding my my gun at, at my side, kind of like a like a soldier. <laughs> Oh, some ninety-nine tips right there. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. That was a great reference. <laughs> and just giving, giving a, uh, you know, a, 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 a few kicks, and then, and then just letting uh, the uh, bottom just kind of uh, uh, pull you down, and you know, drifting down, down through the water column, and and then 
and then just sort of stopping just, just before the bottom and and hitting the bottom in a real gentle way so you're not you're not uh, stirring up the the uh, sediment and then and then just just feeling the the uh, gun in your hand and the weight and and l- looking looking down the down the shaft and then you know seeing seeing a fish and then and then sighting it up and pulling the trigger and and seeing the the uh, shaft hit the fish and just the just the perfect spot and then the fish sort of stops moving and you know you, you've you've hit it you've hit it perfectly you, you know you've, you've uh, turned the uh, lights out on it and yeah that, that's basically it the most perfect dive that, that you can imagine just 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 walk yourself through it um, with as much detail as possible i love that the um i i remember actually now from uh andre pelizzari's <laughs> book <laughs> Um, it's he actually has a section, and it's oh, is it Alberto? Yeah, it's Sorry, Alberto. Shrek, you're a, you're a huge fan after all. Um, but yeah, he he has a there is a section in that book uh, that's quite similar to what you've said there about the relaxation techniques. I think he talks about um, going through muscle by muscle from his toes up to his shoulders when he's doing his breather to get his to get fully relaxed and. Um, and I know that you said you did silly things where you used to go and do static breath holds in the ocean by yourself. Well, I actually did the same thing um, when I started as well. And I used to actually use him, uh, Andre's, whatever his name. Belazari. Alberto or his brother Andre's technique. P- Puka Zulu. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, his relaxation techniques. And it really does help you um, you know, hold your breath longer and fully relax and, and get right into it. So, yeah, I, I can relate um, definitely to that. And there's um, one other thing that you can do when you're when you're diving for for fish that are, that are really cryptic is you can sort of um, visualize what what the fish is going to look like before you see it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but like with with lingcod and, and cabazon, like like you you often just see like you know it's some of the head sticking out of a rock or just like a a bit of a fin or, or whatever. What I've noticed is that if I sort of hold that image, I'm more um, more likely to actually find fish. I think it, it's just like you know, our, our brains work through, through pattern uh, recognition. Yeah, and that, and we can just sort of we can pro- program our brains to to see what um, what we we might be missing uh, otherwise. Yeah, right. Two thoughts come to mind for me when you when you were talking about it. Like, um, our buddy Anvar Mufasilov has got this dive hold. No, what is it? Hold dive shoot um, series where you basically hold your breath with them and you go on a dive with them and you da- go down and shoot shoot this fish and people can hold their breath alongside and just watch his videos when they do that. And the other thing I was going to say is like when you watch the videos, like sometimes when you're new, you've got no idea what um, some of the species you, you're chasing actually look like underwater and how they behave. And um, Watching videos on YouTube is not completely a waste of time because you actually learn to recognize um, species like silhouettes and behavior and body language. And um, so I, I thought that the videos could probably add into like visualization, particularly for guys if they're a little bit inexperienced, like, um, and then they could actually use that stuff in their visualization exercises. Yep, solid. Um, how, how long do you spend doing this? So I, I've been meditating for... Uh, about 20 years or so, pretty pretty off and on. But I've, I, you know, I've, I've had quite long periods where I have a, a daily practice, and and it's nothing that I would necessarily do every single day. But like if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm if I'm prepping for for a big trip, then you know I might I might do it um, might do it several times uh, before the the, the uh, trip. Okay, and and for you, this makes a, a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to give this a, I'm going to give this a try. All right. Let, let's wrap the section up. Hey. But I used to use um, a Headspace app uh, for daily meditation as well. I found that was really good. And you can do, you can try that app for free. Um, there's like, you can do 10 s- sessions and you can do 10 or 15 minute uh, meditations. It was really good for like some of the other free diving stuff is like, you know, like we were talking about isolating in on muscle groups and being aware of the breath in your body. I found that Headspace app to be absolutely magic for that. And there's no, no, it's not, it's not woo woo gaga stuff. It's just kind of like um, practical um, meditation techniques. And um, I really like that. It, it pulled all of the, um, some of the spiritual kind of hot, you know, drama out of it. And it was just a straightforward sort of meditation. Have you used that yourself? No, but um, but I think that, that that's a good point. Is that um, I, so? I I started doing this stuff like before apps were, were a thing, um, 
definitely before the internet w- was a thing. Um, but but basically, like what, what I do, it, there's no like God that I'm bowing to. You know, I'm not like I'm not praising Allah or or worshiping Buddha or or you know <laughs> whatever. Basically, like there's no uh, yeah. denomination, and it's it's uh, it's agnostic, and um, and it's something that that really is uh, uh, available to to anybody um, if they're interested in in seeing how their their uh, their brain can help them in in basically whatever they do, and especially spirit fishing. Shrek, mate, you're a bit of a reader. Tell me about your favourite spearfishing magazine. Definitely a reader and a little bit of a breeder. Uh. <laughs> 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 That's right. A spearing magazine have joined the New Spiro podcast with their super high quality, heavyweight spearfishing publication. These guys have got stories that get contributed from all corners of the globe and they've had photographers like Jesse Cripps and Michael Takash feature who were also guests on the New Spiro podcast. I love those two and uh, their stories are an absolute cracker. At the moment, Jeremy's running a back issue deal for listeners of the New Spiro podcast. If you're in Australia, South Africa or New Zealand, you can email sales at Spearing Magazine and get hold of the whole back catalogue, 19 issues for 60 bucks. Australian. That's right. Jeremy's put this deal just together just for you guys. So email sales at sparingmagazine.com. Mention the Noobs Row podcast and that you'd love to get hold of the whole back catalog for 60 bucks. The funniest thing, uh, what's the funniest part of this interview um, so far from Turbo? No, no, no. no just, move, just, just move into the next section. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was salt in the way. What's the, uh, what's the funniest um, story you have out, uh, from out spearfishing? Yeah, it would, it would probably have to be a uh, yeah, story. I, um, I was with my, my wife. We went out to the coast a, a couple of years ago and, um, you know, sort of a, just a, we we're staying in, in this hotel and it was, it was winter and, um, I brought my my dive gear so I could I could sneak out real early, kind of in the dark when uh, when she'd still be asleep, and and I could go go get a go get a little session in, and uh, and so I you know I did that. I got up in the dark and got out there, and I, I was I was fishing the, this new spot that I hadn't been to before, and there was sort of a a, a rocky creek that uh, you know the, this this uh, little little waterfall that, that uh, gave into this little cove. Um, and it was a reef that extended out maybe 300 yards or so, and some kelp, and it was pretty pretty cool little setup. So I, you know, I got in, I, I swam out, I, I started thinning, and and I got I got out almost all the way to the reef, you know, about 300 yards from from shore, and and uh, I started to have these spasms come on, and um, and they, you know, they they happen every like 20 seconds or so. These stomach spasms, <laughs> um, and uh, I, I know I know Shrek knows, knows where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so you know I, I looked back at shore and and it was it was really really far away and but I, I started i started kicking and and uh but the the spasms got you know got closer and closer together and they got so painful that uh i knew that i had i had one choice and only one choice and uh so code, I, I code brown yeah so you know like 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 i said it's you know in the in in the 40s uh you know, oftentimes, so you, know, you can't you can't exactly like t- take your suit off and and do what you need to do. So so yeah, I, I let it fly and. Um... <laughs> oh no! You didn't you didn't down suit. You just you just let it go in the suit. So so yeah. So now now I, I have you know I I all of a sudden have a situation on my hands. You know I, I have this this uh, this hot bun that I'm that I'm dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and you know the shore is still like 250 yards away and and so you know i'm, I'm swimming and really really stiff like just my ankles barely you know, i can't i can't afford to move it at all basically and uh and so i'm, I'm getting there I'm, I'm i'm getting there really really slowly you know i'm not moving a muscle hardly at all and, and then i get i get almost to shore and uh, i'm in about six feet of water and i see a lingcot <laughs> and, um, you know i see a lingcod so i'm gonna chase the lingcod i chase the lingcod for about a half an hour and and then uh i, I don't end up getting it um and then you know i see these uh these big perch like big, big uh four perch and, uh, I, I shoot a couple of those and um by now i've pretty much forgotten that, that I, I had anything to contend with um, <laughs> so it comes back to me <laughs> 
And so anyway, I, I get out of the water and I, I realize that I, I have a, a serious situation. And uh, but but luckily there's a there's a waterfall right there, and I, I, I you know I take my wetsuit completely off and I I wash it out and um, yeah I mean I, I gave new meaning to the word shampoo. <laughs> How long did the smell stay in that wetsuit? Be honest. You are an animal. Be honest. How, how long did the smell stay in that? Oh, that's <laughs> um, it, it didn't actually. It it uh, it, uh, it it was actually pretty easy to wash out. I I, I stood on, underneath the uh, the waterfall for about a half an hour and, until I was I was hypothermic. And that uh, is because of that wetsuit. We've actually got a perfect segue into the next section, which is the dive bag. So, what's in your dive bag? Head to toe. Let's start with the wetsuit because even after half an hour of you smearing poo all over the inside of it. It did not carry that smell for the rest of your days. Right. There, there is not a visualization technique <laughs> that can get you over that. Seriously. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, my God. That was excellent. Whoop. That was so good. You're the first person to shit in their wetsuit on the podcast. Oh, that's that's great. not next level. Oh, so good. Anyway. Dive bag. What were you saying, Shrek? Well, yeah. What 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 mm. kind of suit is that? Uh, that, that was an, an immersion uh, suit I, I wore for uh, for many 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 years. So uh, the <laughs> operative word was. Oh, you didn't sell that on Craigslist or whatever, <laughs> did you? That's a lender. Oop. Turbo, if you're ever visiting, guess what suit Josh is going to give you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll remind me, you know that, you know that shit joke you made about the salt <laughs> well, you're wearing, well, you're wearing my shitty old wetsuit. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, all right, now let's move into your dive bag oh. then. Mm. What do you got? All right, so the, the dive bag, I, I knew you guys were going to ask this, so I, I had to go out into the shed to, to see what, what I actually have. I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a gear guy. Um, you know, gear is, is what you need to go fishing and, and that's it. Um, so I have a pathos suit that I really like. Keeps me really warm. Um, okay. I have some Abyss carbon fiber fins, hammerhead mask with a GoPro mount that I rarely use. Uh, I do have one one little piece of kit that uh, that I wanted to share. It's a um, a leash. Um, so it it's it's basically a, a a fish stringer made out of a surf leash. Oh, nice! And it works really well. You uh, just need to attach a, a, a like a, a long line clip on it. Okay. And then, okay. And then you, you can basically run that through the the uh, fish's gills and mouth, and then um, on your waist, and it basically it holds the uh, fish really close to you, and and uh, it's just uh, it's a really really easy easy style of stringer. Um, I feel that uh, that um, there's more advantage to be gained in in uh, you know in being fit and um, and in diving well than than in uh, in having the the latest you know the latest tricky gear. Turbo, Turbo's copied you completely there, Josh. He does like four chin-ups um, once a week. And, uh, I mean, assisted, but, um, you know, <laughs> it's still, Shut you know, up. like, yeah. <clears throat> there's something to it, that's, that's for sure. All right, the, nec oh. the next part of the show used to be called um, Fast Five Facts for Noobs, yeah. and then I called it Spiro oh, Q&A. Oh. Uh, Turbo hated it, so oh, hated we've, in season three we've renamed it Turbo's Turds, and uh, these are basically <laughs> he he chooses three of these questions to ask you. Go for it, Turbo. Uh, so ask three of these. All right? Could you describe? It's the same question. <laughs> this is new to me, and they're the same shitty questions. Uh, this is come awful. on. We can't have a no, name anyway. Spiro meeting in the middle of an interview. Yep, all right, okay, and the professionalism. <clears throat> Could you describe what uh, what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? Ocean connection that provides food, exercise, and adventure. Oh, I like it. Oh, that was really well answered. Did you did you pre-prep for that question? <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to answer that, Turbo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew that was just too smooth. All right. Uh, right. Uh, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? I would take a class because now there's classes to take. A free, mm, nice free diving one. class? Yes. Okay. What is the what is the spearfishing destination that you haven't been to that you would most like to visit? 
I love to visit Fiji because I, I see lots of uh, footage of of um, of doggies, uh, dog tooth tuna being shot there, and and um, and they don't get eaten by sharks. Like, I mean, I'm sure that that does happen, but where we are um, in in Tahiti or in the Tuamotu is where the farm is. We have doggies, and you know, we target them frequently, but it's very very rare that we ever land them because they um, they get uh, eaten. It, anything anything that that fights basically will get vaporized by, by the sharks. So I'd have to say, um, yeah. I'd have to say Fiji or some other destination where there's dog tooth and and um, and sharks that are reasonable. Yeah, great destination, Magic. Fiji. All right, um, Josh, you, you did spend a lot of time in Fiji as well. Uh, sorry, in Tahiti as well. I was just going to ask you, like, guys are probably interested in learning a bit more about Tahiti. Um, if they're going to go there on a charter or something like that, what's some kind of advice you'd offer to them for going to Tahiti? Um, get to the outer islands. Basically, um, get get as far away from Tahiti as possible because um, there's there's more people on the main island of Tahiti than, than any other island. So the, uh, the the Tahitian culture, it's a it's a the fishing culture. I'm, I'm convinced there, there's no culture in the world that's as sophisticated as the Tahitian culture um, when it comes to, to fishing. Basically, what that means is that it's pretty fished out. Uh, <laughs> so you want to get away from Tahiti to where there, there's less uh, population density, and um, you're going to find uh, lots more fish in the in the outer islands, and and you're also going to find people that are more uh, more uh, recep- receptive to to taking in uh, taking in um, uh, travelers. Okay, magic. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. So you, you say you say they're the most sophisticated fishing culture. Do you mean that traditionally sophisticated? They're in touch and they know what's going to be where, or have they just adapted uh, technology well? What do you sort of? What does that sentence? Uh, I'd say I'd say all of it. Um, I mean, they you know they 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 invented this boat or you know that, that they chase a uh, mai mai with and. I don't know if you guys have seen footage of that, but yeah. that's that's really really fun. If you ever ever have the opportunity to do that, um, definitely don't let that slip by you. And they're you know they're amazing spear fishermen. There's you know there's there's usually um, in the you know the world's best every year usually has has some Tahitians in the mix, and that's coming from a country of you know 250,000 or whatever it is. Yeah right. Yeah um, wow. wow. So very very good divers. Very very good at just anything that's that's related to to, to fishing and uh, especially spear fishing. Okay cool. Uh, look, um, we're going to wrap it up, Josh. But I wanted to say we haven't really talked about um, underwater photography or your photography work in general today. Um, you you take some magical photos and you do it for a job sometimes. Um, you you know you've shot for Nat Geo, I believe. Um, and I see you got a new website up. People can come and check out at joshhumbert.com. Uh, we'll link up your Instagram. Um, you've got Twitter, Facebook. We'll link up some of these things in the show notes. I was going to ask you what else you got going on, man. Boy, put me on the spot. What are you doing this weekend, Josh? I, I, was, I was actually going to leave an opening there for your your pearls because uh, you got a you got an online uh, thing for that. Right, right, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, so, so basically, it's a it's a loaded question because I I, I feel like I have a lot going on. But um, but yeah, my wife and I run a, an online shop, uh, um, and we we sell we sell pearls on the you know on the internet. Um, and we're we're actually um, anyone who goes to the site and um, punches in the the code noob noob fifteen uh, can get fifteen percent off on that on anything. Hey. But yeah, um, you know, people can can have a look at that on Instagram or or the the uh, website or, or whatever. So where where can they where can they find that? What's the what's the website? Kamoka Pro uh, at Kamoka Pro on Instagram. Okay, cool. I'll link that up in the show notes as well. Awesome. And uh, you working on anything else like with your with your with your photography at the moment? What, what's going on there? Um. So my my photography. Um, Right now, I'm 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 just I'm doing uh, commercial work around Portland. It, um, okay. It's what it's what what pays the uh, bills. It's not it's not very uh, sexy, but um but you know it it uh it, it brings in uh, brings in what, what I need. All right, cool. Man. Yeah, nice. And um, shout out to some of the Portland crew and listeners over there. Um, they are a great bunch of people in your neck of the world, Josh. And uh, it's been an absolute ball to chat with you today. I um, we, Turbo and I. Fantastic. This is one of these interviews we've wanted to have for I think easily two yeah. two years. So it's about bloody time. <laughs> yep. Awesome. And uh, 
and we might have you back at some stage in the future, I think. Excellent. Thanks, Turbo. Thanks, uh, thanks, Shrek. I really appreciate you guys talking to me. No worries, no worries. Man. mate. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> See All you, right. Josh. See you, mate. Take care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. What an awesome chat with Josh today. I thoroughly enjoyed that and uh, really loved hearing about, you know, <laughs> a few of his stories. Uh, very memorable. And uh, I'd encourage you to go and check out Kamoka Pearls. If you've got a lady in your life, then, you know, support a, a Spiro-owned business that's doing the right thing as well. Um, their story is amazing at um, kamokapearls.com. Right, um, we're off in a fortnight to talk with Nikki Watt. She's the first Australian woman to land a billfish by Spear in Australian waters. And uh, it's a black marlin, 155 kg in New South Wales. And uh, she's a real character. This, this interview is, is hilarious. And uh, Turbo and her just uh, have an absolute ball. I'm, I'm in on the interview as well, but it was very much a, just an Aussie, Aussie, Aussie type flavor interview. But real cracker. So look, I'll see you guys in a fortnight. Um, thanks for tuning in today guys go and check out um, Kamoka Pearls and as I mentioned at the start of the show the Stop the Lockout Facebook group jump on there please get behind Spiros in New South Wales and we'll, yep, we'll see you in a fortnight awesome guys in today's episode we discussed getting cold now this is not uncommon most of us will experience cold if we do spearfishing for long enough now to overcome being cold, you can get your hands on a good set of booties, gloves, and a wetsuit. Super important, and it's always that compromise between durability and comfort. But head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a full range of wetsuits. And uh, the thing I like about shopping online, sometimes you can review, you can read a lot of product reviews and get an idea of exactly what you're buying. Now, our show sponsor, spearfishing.com.au, have got a comprehensive list of products with reviews from people just like you and I. So get on there, check out an awesome range of gear, and if you do decide to buy something, pump in the code NoobSpiro at checkout, save $20 on every purchase over $200 at spearfishing.com.au. Thanks for supporting us, guys.